welcome friends to this final session of our Bandara celebrations. It ends today. After this meeting, we go back home except those who are waiting for personal time interviews with me one on one. And we'll have some of them today and most of them tomorrow. I spend the whole day tomorrow meeting you one on one so that I'll be able to see as many of you as possible. If anyone is left over, please let me have your name so you are placed at the top of the list next time. So you don't miss the interview. I know people have some personal questions and they uh, like to ask them personally one on one. I'll be very happy to answer your questions and hear you or whatever you have to say. Uh, we have uh, now some, some questions and answers which are given to me in writing and I think uh, Jonathan has them. He does. Yeah, there he says he has. <laughs> so we'll take up a few questions now. He'll read the question, then I'll read it again for you, and then I'll try to give an answer. Why is the mind so difficult to control in meditation? Why is the mind so difficult to control in meditation? Simple answer, we have made it our master for lifetime after lifetime and doesn't want to give up its position that we have created for it ourselves. We have given the authority to the mind and now it fights. It's almost like fighting for survival. And therefore, when you meditate and want to go above the mind or separate yourself from the mind, it gives the best fight it can. And that is the nature of the mind. It's the duty of the mind. And that was what the mind was supposed to do to give you the strength to communicate, to fight. But the fight is now turning upon yourself. First allowed the mind to fight with others, to go and get attracted to others, go and get attachments to others. Now you are trying to stop it. So he says, you have empowered me and made it into a separate entity. How dare you now stop me? So it fights like an independent thing. But once we are able to overcome the mind by spiritual will, by directing from time to time, during the day, mind wants to do something and suddenly you realize this is the time to stop it. Say, no. Mind says only once, no. No more again, no. Last us time, no. Then the mind, in a few such events you will find mind will begin to see it has no control over you. And you have control over the mind and you start behaving and your meditation will improve. How do you know what the spiritual will is when someone asks you to make a choice? How do you know what the spiritual will is when someone asks you to make a choice? What comes intuitively to you is always spiritual will. What comes without thinking is spiritual will. What corresponds to these circumstances and coincidences around you is spiritual will. But when your mind starts thinking how, what to do, what to say, it's mental will. Could you speak on the worthiness of the disciple to receive grace from the Master and how can one be more receptive? Could you speak on the worthiness of the disciple to receive grace from the Master and how can one be more receptive? The Master does not judge our worthiness. The Master judges our keenness to go back home. If we are seekers and keen to go back home, we are worthy of it. Master appreciates the love and devotion we express for him. Master appreciates our appreciation, what he gives to us. Master appreciates if we are good to everybody else. Master is happy if your lifestyle is like his lifestyle, full of compassion and love for others. So once you have these qualities, you are very worthy of Master's grace. But even if you are not worthy, the grace is there. <laughs> if the grace is already there, then what's the problem? The problem is our cup is not turned in the direction where the grace is flowing. Our cup of attention is somewhere else. Grace is flowing from another area. Turn the cup around toward the grace, it will get filled up. Dear Ishwar, will you please describe the soul? Will you please describe God? Dear Ishwar, will you please describe the soul? Will you please describe God? I could write a book on that. <laughs> the soul is the self. 
the self that you all feel you are the self. If you can eliminate your identification with the body, you say, this is not me. If you can eliminate yourself from sense perceptions, that these are not me, I am using them. If you can eliminate your mind, that's not me, it's a machine I use for thinking. If you can do these three things, you find the soul. The soul is the conscious unit of consciousness that operates these systems and therefore has these experiences. And what is God? God is the totality of all souls. When all souls are put together, that is God. Totality of consciousness is the ultimate creator and is God. In our society, imagination is often relegated to a secondary role. Please comment about the value of imagination in meditation. In our society, imagination is often relegated to a secondary role. Please comment about value of imagination in meditation. Imagination has been relegated to a secondary role by all of us. Because we are using imagination with the pindi mind, with the physical mind. And therefore, our imagination is unreal compared to the physical reality we have created outside. Imagination is not the solid matter that we see outside. Therefore, it's imaginary. While we are looking at imagination from the physical body, it's unreal, imaginary. We're just imagining things. But when you go one step higher, withdraw your attention from the physical body and open up your astral self, your sense, sense, of sense perceptions only, imagination becomes a reality. Imagination is what can create reality for you at that stage. What you imagine in the astral stage becomes reality. As real or more real than this reality. So there, imagination is really real. So it depends on where you are using imagination. In terms of meditation, we use imagination not so much for creating any reality. We use imagination to be able to withdraw our attention behind the eyes. We are so used to focusing attention on things that if I were to say, close your eyes and focus your attention on yourself, you will always be focusing on something other than yourself. Because the process of focusing attention moves you away from the self in order to focus on something. You are focusing attention with your consciousness, with your attention that's flowing from you and you have to focus on something else. You can't focus on the, yourself unless you're withdrawing your consciousness. Unless you're withdrawing attention, you don't know where you are. There's a very big difference between focusing attention on something and withdrawing attention. We are so used to focusing attention and everything that withdrawal of attention looks like a new thing for us. That is why it takes time for us to experience this, to practice this, how to withdraw attention. As an aid to withdrawing attention, we use imagination. Because when we imagine we are somewhere, we are there. We are not focusing on, on that. So when we close our eyes and imagine we are in the center, sitting there, that imagination is we are sitting there, not that there is an image of us sitting there. Then we try to focus our attention, we create an image there and look at it. But we are not that image, we are the one looking at it. When you imagine you are looking at it, that's yourself. So you, when you look at the screen in front of you, imagine you are sitting in this, uh, behind the eyes in the, tenth, behind, in the tenth door, at the sixth floor of this body. When you imagine you are there, you're, you're withdrawing your attention to that point. So even in physical level, when imagination is not real, it's a very great tool for withdrawing your attention behind the eyes. What should we do when we are helpless? What should we do when we are helpless? We should seek help. <laughs> <laughs> we should seek help from the Master. If you are initiated, there is no greater help available than help from the Master. You can't decide what to do, check it out. Do your Simran, talk to the Master and you will get help. And like my good friend, Greg Leveal said yesterday, nothing is impossible. When you have a perfect living master in your head, you're carrying that master with you, nothing is impossible. If you want any help, seek within, seek from the master. Why would a soul choose to be a killer or a victim? 
Soul is never a killer and never a victim. Soul does not participate in killing or in becoming a victim. That's a game being played by the mind through a creation that takes place through the secondary and tertiary worlds that we create. The soul has no role. Killing or becoming a victim is part of the law of karma. You kill, you create bad karma. You be victim, you will kill the person next time. There is a process of law of karma. The, my, the soul has no karma. The soul is not. Soul by identifying with the mind begins to feel it is responsible for that. Otherwise it was all created for the mind. Soul never kills. Soul is never a victim. If you know you are a soul, you never be participating in these things. What is cosmic will and what is free will? Is free will the same as cosmic will? Or is there anything like cosmic will which is predestined? What is cosmic will and what is free will? Is free will the same as cosmic will? Or is there anything like cosmic will which is predestined? This is subject of a whole long lecture, maybe for the whole day. But to briefly state it, when we are in the physical world, we have an experience called free will. And it is real. It's absolutely real. We make choices. So somebody sitting here says I have no free will is a liar. Because he is exercising free will. When a person says I have no free will, I point out to you, you just let this out of your free will. You could have said I have free will. You could have said I don't have free will. You just use your free will to give that answer to me. So, so long as we are in the physical world, free will is a reality for us. If it were not a reality, we could get nothing out of seeking. Then we would say we have no free will even to seek. How can seeking yield any results if we have no free will? When I say seek and you will find, seeking is an act of free will. Therefore, free will in this physical world is real. No matter what we say, free will is real. You remember I presented the choice to a friend of mine who discovered there is no free will. And his argument was actually uh, based on theistic ideas of faith in God. He was at Harvard University and a bright student called me one morning said, I have discovered you have no free will. The argument for discovering that was, if God knows everything and I believe in God, and I believe God's definition that he is omnipresent, omnipotent and omniscient, present everywhere, all powerful and knows everything. Take the third part, knows everything. Does he know what we are going to decide? When we use free will, does God know what we are going to decide? If he knows, how do we have free will? If he knows already what you are going to decide, you don't have a real free will. You have an experience of free will and God really knows what he made you decide. So he has somewhere written up what you will decide when you think you have free will because you don't know. You don't know God. You are not in touch with God. So you can't verify. So on that basis, this friend of mine said, if God knows everything, we can't possibly have free will. I said, will you come to my apartment and we'll check it out a little further. He came. I played a trick on him as I told you earlier. I put a cup of coffee and a cup of tea and an empty cup on a tray. When he came, I presented to him, will you have tea or coffee or nothing? I've got all three cups. And don't use your free will because you don't have any. You can't. Don't use free will. Now tell me. He was stumped with that. He said, you have stumped my whole discovery by just putting three cups. I thought, I thought that I have discovered something really basic. I said, I will prove to you two ways. That you have free will. That is one that you just found out by making a choice. When you make a choice, you have free will. And secondly, that when you say I have free will or not free will, when you wrote to me I don't have free will, you exercise your free will to write that. You had a choice to write something else. Both times you used free will. Now I want to argue against free will. First argument you already given me. If God has knowledge already of what we are going to do, we don't have a real free will because we don't know God. We don't know what his will is. Therefore, we think we have free will. Okay, God knows. So, it's not real free will. 
second argument, more scientific argument, more empirical, more down to earth argument I'll give you, that when you say you have free will and make a choice, how does your brain work to decide what to take? I said, will you have tea or coffee? And you are freely deciding without any influence of anybody. That's called free will. Nobody is telling you what to do. You are deciding, should I take coffee or should I take tea? And then you say, okay, I'll take coffee. What made you decide that? Look into the factors of choice in your head. You will notice all factors of choice are either hereditary, genetic or environmental. Either you have inherited the genes of your father, grandfather who liked coffee and you like coffee as in your genetic sequence or you have been exposed to people who had coffee, you became accustomed to coffee and drank it. There are no third factor. When you make a choice between tea and coffee, these two are the only factors in your head which enable you to make a choice. And both those factors are totally fixed and inalienable, inalterable when you're making a choice. You can't change your genetic makeup, nor can you change the environment through which you have passed. You have really no free will. If I could read your genetic sequences, and if I could read the environment through which you have gone, I could have written beforehand, out of free will, he will choose coffee only. So where is the free will? So it looks like free will. Free will that we exercise here appears to be free will, but it's wonderful that it appears to be free will, which makes us a seeker and makes us go to our true home. Even our seeking and going to true home is predestined. We predestined it. I told you on day one that we made this arrangement ourselves. It's predestined by ourselves, by our own totality. Nobody else made it. But today we are experiencing it as that is separate from us. God is separate from us. We are going to higher self. Even our higher self is separate from us. By the separation, we are creating an experience of free will as a physical free will. Now, about cosmic free will. What is cosmic free will? Cosmic free will is in different ranges depending on what is the cosmos. If you say this universe and the big galaxies and the different suns and moons and planets all this universe is the cosmos. Then free will is real. You are acting within this cosmos. The physical free will is that cosmic free will. But if you go to a higher cosmos, where the whole this cosmos will be created, if you go to the astral cosmos, you will find that you did not really have free will. What you thought you were deciding was already there. You will be able to look into the future and say, wow, that was already, that's how I was making my decisions. I thought I was making my fresh decisions. Now, these were being made according to a pattern that was already existing. I told you once earlier about my own encounter with a turbaned man in, in 1948 who met me. It was 1947 that we had to, we had to leave our homes because of the partition of India into India and Pakistan. And we all leaving our homes and running away. We had no homes and we were rushing. I was in the Dera for many days, traveled by train on top of the train. Big crowds were going, reached New Delhi, running around for looking for a place to live in. We were refugees. At that time I met one man and he said, good luck. I said, my friend, you are Indian, I told in Punjabi. You are Indian Punjabi, I am Indian Punjabi. Why are you speaking English? Why are you saying good luck? He says, because I see good luck in your future. I said, really? Can you tell me how you can see the future? He said, well, give me some money. He said, I knew it's a money game. <laughs> he said, I didn't say how much. I said, I'll give you one pesa, which was less than a cent in Indian currency. I had one piece of that. I put in his pocket, in his hand, and he closed his hand. And he says, I have met you today and spoken to you 29 days from today. Now, this was in January of 2000, uh, 1948. In 29 days, you will get an information by telegram which will be good news for you. And that's why he said good luck. 
29 days after that, you will get bad news. And that will make you distressed. It will be very bad news for you. 29 days after that, I will meet you to check out if these two events have happened. And if they've happened, I will receive the balance of my payment. <laughs> I dismiss that. that the idle talk. Let him have his penny. They moved on. I was trying to find some work, some business. And I was trying to do any kind of business at that time because I had no job. Everything I had left off behind in Lahore, in which, became, which went into Pakistan. So having nothing with me, I joined hands with a, another doc doctor. I had some experience in homeopathic remedies and he had experience in allopathy doctor. We joined hands together and we decided that we should do some business together. And he said, we can open a clinic. I said, I can distribute some products for sale. I applied for, while I and Dr. West did try to set up a clinic, I asked for a distributorship of tea which was being made in South India. It's a different kind of tea. And I said, I can distribute it in North India. And I received a telegram. You have been appointed distributor of our tea. I will have a telegram. What date is it? 29 days after I met that man. And amazing. Then I prepared myself for bad news. 29 days later, I got information on the 2nd of April that my master has passed away in his physical body. That was quite a shock. Although the master was with me, I couldn't see him. But the physical form looks even wonderful, more wonderful when you've seen the inner form. It's not that the physical forms become unnecessary. You have so much experience of the master inside. The physical form looks even better while you are in the physical body. So it was something I missed and I said, this is really, the men were right. How could he possibly now see me? We went and set up a clinic about 45 miles out of Delhi in a town called Meerut. We set up a clinic jointly and one day the allopathic doctor said, we need supplies of surgical supplies and these supplies. Will you go and get these from one of the pharmaceutical stores in Delhi? So I went that day to get from the store. I was just outside the store and somebody hit me on the back. I looked around, same guy. He said, there's the second, the third 29th day. I was so stunned by that. I said, how could he guess things like my master's passing away? How could he possibly know these things? It's impossible for anybody to know these things. So much in advance. I said, I am totally indebted to you for what you have shown me. You have proven to me that predestiny is written somewhere that you could read, that you could give me this information. Otherwise, I can't imagine anybody knowing this. He said, give me the balance of the money. <laughs> I took out five bucks. So here's five bucks. Is it not five bucks? You know, I said, I am a refugee, I've come to buy some supply. He says, that right pocket of yours is 75 bucks. <laughs> I said, this fellow is very clever. <laughs> Take 75 bucks. This was one incident that shocked me. After that, I was trying for different jobs. And I applied for the Navy, Indian Navy. And I went to Lucknow, another town, another state, for an interview. And after the interview was over, I came out and I found another guy. Similar to this one. Good luck. I said, this is again another fellow. Let's see what he's going to say now. So he said, do you have a piece of paper? I said, yes. I had a lot of papers in my bag. I gave a piece of paper. He looked at my eyes and began to write something. And after that, he folded it up. He said, hold it in your hand. The folded paper. I held it in my hand. Do you have more paper? I said, of course, there is more paper. He said, this new paper now, write a number between 1 and 10. And I said, this is a very old trick we used to play as kids also. Write a number quickly, write a number quickly between 1 and 10. We all write 5, middle number. I said, this is what he is expecting me to do. Now, I am not going to be caught. I call off his bluff. I write 3. So, I wrote 3. He said, write 
the name of a flower. I said, you expect me to write the co most common flower, a rose. He thinks I will write rose. I am going to write the name of a flower this guy may never have heard of. So I knew flower, we knew. It actually is a jasmine species called chameli. So that's a popular flower in Punjab. So I said, I'll write chameli. So I wrote C-H-A-M-E-L-I in English. He said, write your date of birth. I wrote 1926. He said, that's your year of birth. Write your date. So normally, in India, we write the date first, then the month, and then the year. Here, we write the month first, date first, but year is always at the end. I wrote the date and the, uh, and the month later after that. He said, open the paper I gave you earlier. I opened the paper. It said, 3 Chabeli, 1926, and then the date. <laughs> I said, I can't believe how you could write this when I even hadn't decided about it. I had not used my free will to decide what to write. While I was still stunned with this discovery that he knew this thing, he said, shall I tell you more? I said, go ahead. He said, when I asked you to write a number between 1 and 10, you said he is expecting me to write 5. And I am going to call off his bluff and I will write 3. And then you wrote 3. He knew even the thought sequence by which I wrote. And he knew it before I ever wrote, before I ever thought. And when you said, write the name of a flower, he is expecting me to write rose. And I will not write rose. I will write the name of flower which he had never heard of. He repeated all these words. He repeated exactly the thinking that I had and the thinking was done after he had written everything. That was the clearest proof I had that he is reading from somewhere. It is already pre-written what I thought was my free will. I said, where did you learn this kind of method that you can know somebody? I can know people who can read your mind. Read your mind is when you are thinking, they can also know what you are thinking. Telepathically, people can read your mind. But how can somebody read your mind when you haven't even used your mind? When you haven't even thought something? An evidence that I can't forget that there is a place where it is pre-written. What you would think, what you would decide. If that is true, then free will is not actually real. It is somewhere. It's only an experience we are having here. When you go to the astral plane, you will find it's all written there. But there is, now is that a cosmic will? It could be co co cosmic will because it's pre-written. And we are all following the cosmic will. Free will stays within the cosmic will. But supposing you have a master or a very holy person who has powers to go to astral plane and change destinies. And there are people who change destinies. And you go for divine intervention in some problem of yours. Master, I can't do this. This is my... This is my horoscope. This is my chart. It says I'm going to go through this illness. Can you help? Okay, okay. I'll pray. I'll pray to Master. Pray to God and help you. And your destiny changes. And you say, wow, see? Even pre-written destiny can be changed. And you go and see that in the astral plane, it has actually changed. That what was a destiny pre-written which you had read earlier, the second time you're reading, is changed. So that means... There is some kind of free will, at least at that level, that you can change it by divine intervention. Then you meditate more and go to the causal plane. And you find even the divine intervention was also written there. And even that was pre-written. So it depends what you call cosmic will. If the will is at the very top of creation of the experience of free will here, it's all pre-written there. Pre-written by who? By ourselves. Now, if it is all pre-written by ourselves, should we call it our free will or not? If you are a spiritual person, you will say yes. I don't know here. I am making choices here. But actually, the will was written somewhere else. I wrote it, but I wrote it not here, but somewhere else. I came prepared by pre-writing my destinies and I am now experiencing it because I love to find, I love making choices. I love the freedom to make choices. And I created such a beautiful way to create freedom of choice. How did I create? Very simple method. We employed the simplest of methods. 
to create the experience of free will by becoming ignorant of the future. That's very simple. If we knew the future here, there will be no free will. Just by blocking our knowledge of the future, we don't know what's going to happen. Therefore, we say we are deciding what will happen. Just by becoming ignorant, we created a wonderful experience of free will. I say ignorance is bliss. Cosmic will is the ultimate will, then we are part of it. Even that cosmic will, where we made choices, what destiny to have, is also pre-written in our true home. In the true home, when we are one, the whole thing was pre -written. The whole show is created in one instant which we are playing out in time and space. One more. Two more. If, if, if it's your will. Um, I think I, if I am not exercising my free will today. <laughs> there, there are many more questions, but you're right that time yeah, is limited. Because of time, we'll take up a couple of them. Two more. Per se, per se. After the body dies, when does the soul leave the body? And is there any difference for the soul between the body being buried or the body being cremated? After the body dies, when does the soul leave the body? Is there any difference for the soul between the body was buried or the body was cremated? The soul does not leave. The soul is steady in its own place. Soul never moves. What causes us to move, whether by reincarnation, whether by moving with the legs, or whether by moving in an aeroplane, what moves are the covers upon the soul. Soul never moves. Soul never leaves anything, nor gets into anything. Soul is covered by the kind of experiencing things. That means something by which we can experience, consciousness can experience things. The mind is the first one that we, and mind moves. Mind moves from here to there, and thinking takes us from here to there. So, mind creates this movement. The astral body flies, it moves from place to place. The physical body has a hard time moving, it doesn't move also. We have been all moving around here. When a person dies, the soul does not die, only the physical body dies. Astral body does not die. Mind does not die, only the physical body dies. Therefore, what moves is the astral body, not the soul. The astral body moves to a different state. It can be, it can go into a state of disembodied state, in which it can just stand next to the body that just dead. It can be watching the body dead. In some cases, I have noticed in my friends' cases, they were able to die seconds before the body ceased. In one case, there was a murder. The body was being murdered by somebody and the astral body stepped out just seconds before it and saw the murder of the own body. The body, when we say soul moves, we are talking of astral body. Most people call that the soul. What is reincarnated is not soul. What is reincarnated is the astral body. From one body to another, the astral body keeps moving. After very long time, thousands of years, the, mo the mind creates a new astral body and then that moves. One astral body dies after 3000 years or so and another astral body is picked up by the mind there. Mind does not die for millions of years, physical time, for 3 million years. So we carry the same mind, same karma, same things for millions of years with several lifetimes of the astral body and many more lifetimes in the physical body of different forms of life. So therefore, when we die and leave the body, astral body steps aside and can see the disembodied spirit, which is not soul, it is soul plus mind plus another sensory body that can watch what is happening. What happens to the physical body that is dead, it contains nothing. Whether you cremate it or you bury it or dispose of any other way, it's just waste, waste flesh and bones and there is nothing in it. So it doesn't matter at all how the disposal takes place. Except if the person who dies has ideas about what will happen to my body and builds those ideas and says I'll be buried and then see the body being taken by people that are being burnt. Say, oh my God, what is going to happen now? 
it is not the body that is being affected by if the disembodied spirit is right there to watch what is happening, which sometimes happens depending upon the attachments we have. If we have attachments to people who are around, we stay there watching what's going on. And sometimes it's very interesting. The people who loved us and then they were so wonderful to us, permanent friends of ours. We didn't know we will ever leave them by dying. We die. And then we say, do they still love us? And they are worried about where your, where your pocket book is, where your wallets are. They are look, looking at something else. They are trying to look, what is, what is the will? Where did, what did we get? And one wonders, is that what I lived for? What I thought was true love with these people? That's a very different experience. So therefore, when we die, the body is of no consequence at all. But we are of consequence. So if you want to honor the guy who dies... And he says, I want to be buried. Bury him. Bury his body. He might be watching. If he says, I want to be cremated. <laughs> and he wants to be cremated. Burn it and he'll watch. And he'll wonder why I thought of burial or burning. It makes no difference to him. But that's too late for him to decide what to do. So there is no real difference. At the September workshop in 2013, you asked us to remind you to talk about the Master's compassion sometime. Here is a reminder. <laughs> At the September workshop in 2013, you asked us to remind you to talk about the Master's compassion sometime. Here is a reminder. We start a new workshop now. <laughs> No, but I must say the questioner has good memory to remember something from 2013. I, I compliment that. Master's compassion is so natural. It's built upon his constant awareness of who he is. He's part of all of us. Not, not in thought, in awareness. He's aware that we are all the same. His compassion is for the manner in which the totality of consciousness has been divided into individuated consciousness and created so many souls. And then souls created into different forms by mind, by senses, by bodies, by forms of different kinds in the created universes. At that point of view, this is not the only universe. There are millions of universes like this one. And a master sitting here in this universe is conscious of all the universes also. It's a very vast area of awareness. Master carries that awareness when he is sitting with us as the human body. So what, how would he look at us? He looked at us as part of him that's undergoing an experience which requires compassion because that unit of ourselves, that part of ourselves, doesn't like, doesn't like to be suffering. Supposing you think you are the body, physical body, your knee hurts. You say, I hate you. Can you say that to the knee? You say, I want to help the knee because it's me. The knee is part of me, therefore I'm wanting to help. The master thinks all people, all creation is part of him. And therefore, his compassion is automatic and natural. He doesn't have to decide, let me be compassionate. His compassion and love flows from him automatically because of his awareness. The awareness creates that compassion and love automatically. And not only masters compassion. Any disciple who reaches that level of awareness has the same compassion and same love for everybody. So this is a natural state when you have that high awareness and discover that not only were you trying to be one, not trying to be close, but you are one. Compassion becomes automatic and natural. And that is Master's compassion. I am very happy I could answer a few questions of yours. We will keep some for next time. Let's wind up this with a short meditation. Sit in a position that your body doesn't have to shake around. Close your eyes. Go to your meditation chamber behind the eyes at the third eye center. Right in the center behind the eyes, 
where you feel that you exist. Where your existence is there, not your body. Your consciousness is there, not your body. And meditate using all methods that you know. You can repeat Simran, Mantra. You can listen to music. Listen, you can listen to sounds. You can visualize your master. But take this opportunity to express your love to your master in the best way you can. Express your gratitude to your master. Ask for forgiveness if you feel you have done anything wrong ever. Ask for forgiveness for yourself and for forgiveness for everybody else that you might have hurt ever. Ask for total forgiveness and express your love and devotion and gratitude to your master. Keep your eyes closed till I count five. One, two, three, four, five. Open your eyes and welcome back. How many of you really enjoyed this last meditation session? Very happy for you. I'm happy for all of you. That was wonderful.